Welcome to Lesson 6a, Beloved Bernoulli Equation. In this lesson, we derive the Beloved Bernoulli Equation, and we discuss its applications and limitations. We'll also do a couple example problems. First, the derivation. We start with the head form of the energy equation. Recall that we developed this in a previous lesson along a streamline from upstream location 1 to downstream location 2. This is the form without any pumps or turbines. Now let's simplify further. Namely, let's let the irreversible losses, the HL term, be negligible. And that's all the derivation we need. This yields what I call the beloved Bernoulli equation. All the terms in this equation have dimensions of length, or head, which is pressure expressed as an equivalent column height of a fluid. Alternatively, we can multiply each term by rho g and get this equation, where all terms have dimensions of pressure. Keep in mind that we're talking about flow through some kind of a duct, perhaps, along a streamline. But 1 and 2 can be any two locations along that streamline. So this equation in general says that this grouping of terms is constant along the streamline, which I write here. This is the most beloved form of the Bernoulli equation. I call it the beloved Bernoulli equation. P plus 1 half rho v squared plus rho gz equal constant along a streamline. Hey dude, why do you call it beloved Bernoulli? Because students love this equation and want to apply it everywhere, even when it's not appropriate. Whatever you say, man. I never thought of any equation as being beloved. Well, you'll see what I mean later. There's an alternative derivation in the textbook. We derive the same Bernoulli equation by starting with Newton's second law. We get the same equation as above, the beloved Bernoulli equation, but from vastly different physics. I find this amazing. We got this equation from conservation of energy, and we get the same equation from Newton's law. In either case, we end up with the beloved Bernoulli equation. I must caution that the beloved Bernoulli equation is valid only if all of the following limitations are met. The flow has to be steady, incompressible. We're talking about flow along a streamline. There can't be any pumps or turbines along the streamline. There has to be negligible heat transfer and negligible irreversible head losses. Typically we're talking about friction and viscous effects. The Bernoulli equation is not valid in regions where viscous effects are important, such as within boundary layers. Let's take flow along a wall where there's a boundary layer. This region within the boundary layer is a region where viscous effects are important, so beloved Bernoulli does not apply. This region out here above the boundary layer is a region where viscous effects are not significant. In that region, beloved Bernoulli can be used. Keep in mind that our beloved Bernoulli equation is an approximation. So I'm going to discuss some applications and limitations of the beloved Bernoulli equation. First, I'll do a quick demo floating a ping pong ball with a hair dryer. How does the ball stay there? Well, here are some streamlines. If the ball shifts a little bit to the left, the flow will no longer be symmetric, and the flow on the right side will be at a higher speed than the flow on the left side, since more of the air is blowing on the right side. Beloved Bernoulli tells us that the pressure here will be lower, since the velocity is higher. That'll provide a restoring force that brings the ball back. Now consider lift on a wing. Here's a two-dimensional wing. I've outlined the boundary layer and the wake. This orange covered region is viscous, and therefore Bernoulli equation is not valid in that region. But out here, outside the boundary layer in the wake, we can apply the Bernoulli equation. On the top of the wing, we have high speed, therefore low pressure. Here for an airplane wing in air, we ignore elevation effects. And you can see that when V is high, P is low. In the region below the wing, we have a lower speed and therefore a high pressure. Well, high pressure at the bottom of the wing and low pressure at the top of the wing leads to a net lift force, which we'll call FL. The beloved Bernoulli equation is quite valuable when analyzing airplane wings. Now consider long straight sections of pipe flow. Suppose we have a section of pipe that's fully developed and laminar. I sketched the velocity profiles. Consider a streamline from some location 1 to some downstream location 2 along a streamline right in the middle of the pipe. Let's apply beloved Bernoulli. I'll use the head form. Mr. Student, what can you conclude about P1 and P2? Well, dude, if it's fully developed, then V2 has to equal V1, man. Okay, so these two cancel. And since the pipe is horizontal, the Z's have to cancel out, dude. Okay, I'll cross those terms out. Then P1 has to equal P2. 
Well, does that make any sense? I don't know, dude. I'm confused. Well, we know that P1 can't equal P2. In fact, since there are head losses due to friction, the love of Bernoulli does not apply. To solve this problem properly, we have to go back to the head form of the energy equation and include the head loss term. So you must use this equation instead. You tricked me, dude. Now I know why they call it the beloved Bernoulli equation. Yes, it's beloved because students always want to use it. But you have to be careful to apply beloved Bernoulli only where it's appropriate. Let's look at converging and diverging pipes or ducts. Suppose we have a converging duct with flow from left to right. As we go through this converging duct, speed must increase to conserve mass. Therefore, pressure must decrease. If we have the opposite case, a diverging duct, the speed decreases to conserve mass. Therefore, P must increase. But how can pressure increase in the direction of the flow? I talk about this in a little more detail in this short two-minute video. I'll show a clip from that here. But how can the flow go downstream if the pressure upstream is lower? Well, you need to remember that this section of duct is just one section in an overall duct system. I'll show you. Suppose the whole duct looks like this. If the flow is driven by a high pressure tank, we have approximately stagnation conditions here. This is what drives the flow. But in each section, pressure can go up or down. In the converging part, velocity goes up and pressure goes down. In the diverging part, velocity goes down and pressure goes up. This part's also converging. The bottom line is that as speed increases, pressure decreases. And as speed decreases, pressure increases. Only this part is the section of duct that was on the exam. Thanks, Professor. That makes sense. Of course it does. Thank you, sir. Well, I still find it hard to believe, dude. Then go back and reread the book and study your notes. And don't call me dude. Let's do an example problem. There's a flow rate measurement device called a Venturi tube. You put it in a pipe. There's a converging section followed by a diverging section. And our goal is to measure the speed or the volume flow rate in this pipe. Let's let location 1 be upstream of the Venturi and 2 be in the throat. This is water, which is incompressible, so speed V2 has to be bigger than speed V1. In this case, we have water at 20 degrees C. Area A1 is four times larger than the cross-sectional area A2 at the throat. We're going to neglect any irreversible losses. And suppose we know that V1 is 2 meters per second. We also measure the gauge pressure at 1. Now I want to estimate the gauge pressure at 2. I start with conservation of mass for the incompressible steady case. V1A1 must equal V2A2, which we can solve for V2. V2 is equal to V1A1 over A2. Now we apply beloved Bernoulli from 1 to 2. I'll use the pressure form. Since this Venturi meter is horizontal, the Z's cancel. We subtract P atmosphere from both pressures. We can do that since we're just subtracting P atmosphere from both sides of the equation. So now we have P1 gauge and P2 gauge. But plug in this equation from conservation of mass. A little bit of algebra yields P2 gauge equal P1 gauge minus 1 half rho V1 squared A1 over A2 squared minus 1. We were given in the problem statement that A1 over A2 is 4, and this is our answer in variable form. I plug in the values with some unity conversion factors, and I get 20.060 kPa. I give my final answer to three significant digits, 20.1 kPa. Now let's look at a pitot-static probe. Here I show you one. And here's a close-up picture. It's a tube within a tube. The tube at the nose is connected to this inner tube that goes to one end of a pressure transducer. There's four or five holes circumferentially at this location, and those are open to the outer tube, which connects to another tubing that goes to the pressure transducer. Let's call this point 1 and this point 2. And let speed V be the upstream speed we're trying to measure. It turns out that right at the nose, the flow goes to zero speed. We call this a stagnation point. So V1 equals zero. And the pressure is high there because it feels the full blunt of the flow coming at it. Consider a streamline just above the boundary layer so we can apply Bernoulli equation. Point two is actually the average of all five of these holes. The holes here are actually called static pressure taps, which we've discussed previously. Static pressure tap is a hole normal to the flow. You can see that that's the case here. So P2 is the static pressure, and V2 is approximately the same as V, where V is the speed we're trying to measure. That's because this probe is so slender and long here that the flow adjusts itself, and the speed here is the same as the speed here, approximately. 
Now we're ready to apply Beloved Bernoulli along this streamline from 1 to 2. I'll use the pressure form again. P1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared plus rho G Z1 equal P2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared plus rho G Z2. The elevations cancel out even if this is a liquid, because the probe is horizontal and 2 is actually an average of all these static pressure taps, so the average z is the same as the z at 1. We said that v1 was 0, since it's a stagnation point, so that term goes away. And we said that v2 was v, so beloved Bernoulli reduces to p1 equal p2 plus 1 half rho v squared, which we can solve for v. v equal square root of 2 over rho times p1 minus p2. Notice that this is what the transducer is reading. It's a differential pressure transducer. You can use a manometer instead. But this transducer measures P1 minus P2. Or you can just call that pressure difference delta P. So V is just 2 delta P over rho. This is called the pitot formula. And it's used to measure speed in a flow. Keep in mind that you have to align this probe with the flow. In other words, parallel to the flow. So this is especially useful in situations where you know the direction of the flow, for example in a wind tunnel. So finally let's do an example problem using a pitot-static probe. We use a pitot-static probe to measure the wind speed in a wind tunnel. The air is warm, 40 degrees C, and we measure the pressure difference between the two ports of the probe with a transducer that reads out in centimeters of water. It's not unusual to have pressure transducers that have these units, and our reading is 17.65 centimeters of water. What's the speed of the air in the wind tunnel? I'll use the pitot formula we just derived. V equals square root of 2 delta P over rho. Be very careful here we have two different densities. This density is the density of the flowing fluid, which is air. So this density is rho air. At 40 degrees C, you can look up the density of air. Or if I had given a pressure, you could calculate it using the ideal gas law. But what is delta P? We go back to our discussion about hydrostatics. When you have a reading like this, we're talking about an equivalent column height of fluid representing a pressure. So delta P is rho G times that equivalent water height. But again, you have to be careful. This rho is rho of the equivalent column height liquid, in this case water. So this rho is rho water. Putting all this together, V is the square root of 2 rho water G H water over rho air. And that's our answer in variable form. Finally, we plug in the numbers. These pressure transducers assume that the density of the water is 1,000 kilogram per meter cubed, G, and then our reading, which I converted from centimeters of water to meters of water, divided by rho of the air. We see kilogram per meter cubed on both the numerator and denominator, and since this is meter squared per second squared square root, we don't need any unity conversion factors. I get 55.423 meters per second. To three significant digits, my final answer is 55.4 meters per second. The bottom line is that everybody loves the beloved Bernoulli equation, and it's very useful for lots of situations, as we showed here. But you have to be very careful that you don't apply it where it's not appropriate. Keep in mind all these limitations before you apply the beloved Bernoulli equation. Thanks, dude. Now this is my most beloved lesson. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.